On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Obama's new supercomputer, Atmel helps you secure the Internet of Things, and DEF CON shows you how to hack the things that can kill you. Twiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 153, recorded August 14th, 2015. Atmel and the Internet of Things that can kill you. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. And by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to Harry's.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code ENTERPRISE when you check out. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an internet that you'll actually like. Use blogs, calendars, file sharing, forms, task management, and wikis to work better together with your team. Sign up now and try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Fallis here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But I don't guide you alone. I've got my regular cast of characters, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, you're in a blue room today. I do not recognize it, and I fear change. Padre, I'm in the same room I'm usually in. Just uh, have the camera pointed in a different direction because we're doing some reconfiguration as we prepare to move the Swamp Studio to a new location sometime later this year. Well, I, well I, I'm, I'm going to have to take some time to, to figure out the new configuration. But someone who I need no time to figure out because he's also my co-host for Coding 101, Mr. Lou Maresca, a senior lead over at Microsoft in their CRM department. Lou, how are you this fine day? Doing fantastic. Actually, better than the weather today. It looks like uh, rain cold today and then here over Seattle. But oh, well, I'm home. That's what it's all about. <laughs> well, we're all just waiting for El Nino to come over and drop a couple of swimming pools worth of uh, rain onto every square inch of California. So who knows? Maybe you're getting it early. Well, gentlemen, we've got a, uh, a action packed show today. We're going to be talking about the Internet of Things, specifically how one company that has become sort of synonymous with the Internet of Things is trying to secure it. And then we're going to show you a little something, something that we picked up from Black Hat DEF CON 2015. But first, let's go ahead and jump into the blips. This first one is all about the Internet of Compromised Things. Now, we have been ringing the warning bell about the increased ease in which Soho routers can be exploited. And today, well, the news gets worse. Dan Gear, the keynote speaker from Black Hat last year and a National Intelligence Security Advisor, summarized the state of home and Soho routers by saying... The only way to fix the problem is to unplug all the devices, throw them in a dumpster, and install all new ones. Though it sounds glib, his prediction seems to be proving true. Vendors from Cisco to the no-name Best Buy box have all said how comically it easy it is to exploit their designs because they all share the same binary blobs as their firmware. At last year's DEF CON, conference goers were able to demonstrate 15 zero-day vulnerabilities in boxes from Asus, Netgear, D-Link, Belkin, Linksys, ActionTet, TrendNet, and more. The worst case scenario is, well, worst case. In the words of Dan Gear, who needs to own the core if you control the edge? Apple turns to business for iPad growth. Now, sales of the iPad have been tumbling since the first quarter of 2014 when they peaked at 26.4 million units. Now, Apple is looking beyond consumers and to the enterprise for the tablet pick-me-up it desperately needs. Apple has partnered with more than 40 technology firms to make the iPad a more appealing tool for business customers. The project has been internally referred to as the Mobility Partner Program, or MPP. Apple's partners are working to develop iOS apps for business, and Apple will review their apps, suggest detailed changes, and encourage the partners to build apps that work together. Long-term goal is to sell business apps bundled 
designs for specific industries, though the project is, as usual, for everything Apple, shrouded in secrecy. Growing your 3D own 3D prints. Carbon 3D is a company that's come up with a way to actually grow 3D prints. Joseph D. Simone, CE and co-founder of Carbon 3D, a chemistry professor at Chapel Hill, and his team have come up with a way to actually grow objects of a pool out of a pool of resin. The group has developed a resin that can withstand high temperatures along with a new patented approach called CLIP, or Continuous Liquid Interface Production. This process works with the balance liquefy and sol solidify materials at precise points in the printing process. UV light rapidly solidifies the resin and oxygen counteracts the effect, ensuring that the thin liquid layer remains in the tray. To make the object, a small overhead platform dips into the liquid source and it pulls the resin out of the pool slowly and the UV light actually starts to solidify it. They've adapted this process to use a range of materials from silicone to hard rubbers for automotive application purposes. This reminds me a lot of the Star Trek replicator. You dial what you want in and it grows before your eyes. If you have time, check out uh, the TED Talk by Joseph. It's kind of cool. San Jose-based Ubiquity Networks announced in their quarterly financial report that $46.7 million had been stolen from their coffers by an international wire transfer scam. Discovered in June on June 5th of this year, the scam known as a business email compromise or man in the email attack uses names, email addresses, and other information available on a company's website to impersonate employees who have relationships with the company's bankers. Ubiquity admitted that they were concerns over financial reporting that have been fixed, though it is being unsurprisingly mum about exactly what those concerns were. They insist that this will not happen in the future. Of the $46.7 million stolen, 8.1 has been recovered, with another 6.8 caught up in jurisdiction and expected to be recovered. The rest, well, that may be hanging in the wind. The FBI is aware of the scam and recommends two-step or two-factor authentication for official communications to avoid becoming a victim. Red Hat Satellite 6.1 does Linux containers. Red Hat has updated its satellite systems management product to 6.1, adding Linux containers to the growing list of resources that it tracks and manages. Now, satellite is not systems management in the direct day-to-day -day operational sense. Instead, it discovers new servers on the network, provisions them if desired with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and tracks the status of a running system. A container system like Docker Engine still formats and assembles the software components into a container. Then, Satellite tracks where they're deployed, which version is being used, who's authenticated to use the container, and how they'll be integrated with other infrastructure software. The Satellite server version is a $10,000 annual subscription with an additional small subscription attached to each Red Hat resource being managed. Superfish has a power-up. Remember Lenovo's Superfish where they shipped laptops with adware on them that opened people up to man-in-middle attacks? Well, it seems Lenovo's at it again. At some some of their newer de newer devices, even if they wipe device, if you wipe your device, Lenovo's firmware or their the Lenovo software to your Windows install, it replaces Windows system version auto check, where which it actually verifies your their logical integrity of your file system, and then that will actually forcefully install Lenovo check and Lenovo update, which has full admin privileges. Automatically, they connect to the internet, they download and install drivers, they optimize your system, and whatever else Lenovo wants to install on your computer. Lenovo software also instrumented the code to send telemetry data to Lenovo, which contains details of your running system. Doesn't sound that bad? Well, security researcher Roel Schuenberg found and reported a buffer overflow vulnerability in the LSE and can be exploited to gain administrative access to your machine. Lenovo has accepted this vulnerability and provided an updated firmware to remove it. Current Lenovo device, up, update your firmware immediately. Are high orbits the new low-hanging fruit? At DEF CON, Colby Moore from Synac demonstrated how a $600 software-defined radio could be used to listen in on and possibly inject traffic into the Global Star network being used to track cargo traveling around the United States. It was a great presentation, one that we'll be showing you in a few weeks, but the worst of satellite news came from DEF CON 23, not from a tracking hack, but from a space-borne botnet. Sophie Talma demonstrated an exploit at Black Hat and DEF CON that exploited greed to turn set-top boxes into botnets. Most of those set-top boxes run Linux, and some people chose to buy or share cards for those boxes in order to gain access to satellite programming that they wouldn't otherwise have. So naturally, Talma decided to figure out how difficult it was for him to create a satellite-connected botnet from infected boxes. 
The answer was not hard at all. His presentation showed how a little C++, a server advertising free cards, and a little moral flexibility meant that people came to you to install a botnet on their boxes. Well, that does it for the blips. When we come back, we are going to be going to have a conversation with Rob Valaton, the VP and GM of Atmel. He wants to talk to us about the Internet of Things, specifically what Atmel is doing to secure the next generation of the Internet of Things. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a, a moment to pause and thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And let me start by asking you a question. Do you own your own business? Or, or maybe are you responsible for hiring people for the business that you work for? If so, then you understand that the talent that you find, the talent that you hire, the employees that you have, well, they determine how much your company is worth. They determine if you're going to have success or failure in your projects. And uh, guess what? It's summertime, and summer is really the best time to grab up the best of the best of the best. Your competitors are on vacation in between projects, and some of the best hires are just coming off of their vacations, ready to get back to work rested. In other words, you need to go if you want to succeed. But you got to do it the right way. Posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates, and short staffing leaves little time to post to dozens of job sites. But thanks to ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites with a single click and be instantly matched to candidates from over 4 million resumes. But you don't have to listen to me. Vivian, a real ZipRecruiter client, wrote, I signed up for a free account and didn't expect a customer service call until it came time for me to apply for a paid subscription. Just an hour after sign up, I got an excellent call from Jeff, a computer service rep. In the first few days, I found two quality candidates. Just post once, and within 24 hours, watch your candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. ZipRecruiter has been used by over 400,000 businesses, and you can try it now for free. Getting the right people for your company is so important. Do you really want to leave it up to chance? Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-E-T. -E and we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. We welcome to the show the VP and GM of Atmel, Mr. Rob Valaton. Rob, thank you very much for coming on to This Week in Enterprise Tech. Hey, Father Robert, thanks for having me. Uh, now, we uh, I've been anticipating this. We set this up a, a while ago because we specifically wanted to have a conversation about what the Internet of Things is going to become in an era in which the Internet of Things is now starting to be associated with the Internet of Insecure Things. Uh, we have seen the IoT grow up over the past, I'm going to say, two, three years from sort of a curiosity, uh, something that you saw in the lab, something that had connected toasters and refrigerators just out of curiosity to something that is now capturing important data, crucial data, sometimes mission critical data. And yet the same emphasis on security hasn't been placed on the Internet of Things that we would on a traditional server service or data center. Can you talk a little bit about that? What what patterns have you seen as the Internet of Things has grown up? Okay. Well, um, I, I agree with your assessment, first off, and uh, the general statement as the uh, of the industry right now. The Many of the uh, OEMs and the inventors, uh, the innovators that are out there right now, is security is always thought of as an afterthought because it's many times it's viewed as a tax on their products. So if they're trying to produce something that's innovative, get it to market, be competitive and be able to sell it. They don't want, they think putting uh, additional security measures, especially where we come from, we think hardware security is the only way, not just the right way, but the only way to keep things ultimately secure. They look at it as a tax on their system. So it's, it's taking education, but I think what we're also seeing in the last 12, 18 months where you're you're almost reading about the hack a day on systems and products, um, people are coming in the fourth it's becoming more in the forefront of their mind and it's becoming more in the forefront of how they're starting to architect their products that says, yeah, we get it. Uh, we need to have it. But I think that's still only of the educated. Uh, there's still a lot of innovators out there and a lot of companies that we haven't heard of yet today. They're going to continue to build products. We've got to somehow get security more in the forefront of everybody's mind from the architecture standpoint, keeping it safe first and then building all the others, the, the differentiation, the performance, et cetera. I like that idea of, of keeping security in mind as you're designing your products. But there, there was sort of a, a mantra that I heard in the Internet of Things side from both Black Hat and DEF CON this year. And that was, 
you can't really design good security until you know what something is for. When you, when you can define the mission parameters of a specific piece of gear, a piece of hardware, then it becomes easier for you to decide what your users should and should not be able to do. But one of the defining features of the Internet of Things is that it is so nebulous, it is so movable, it is so flexible. Do we really yet know what we want the Internet of Things to do, or, or is that something that, that gets left up to every single person, entity, company that designs something for the IoT? Yeah, that's actually a really good question, and, and actually I think uh, an astute statement. So I actually think the Internet of Things is going to be what the individuals want it to be. I don't, I'm not so sure you can actually really encompass what it, quote-unquote, is, because it is going to be different from uh, – innovator to innovator, consumer to consumer. And then I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent, but to extrapolate what you said as well is, so so let's let's park that, because I think the internet of, you know, I've also heard of it, it's called the internet of everything, right? So it's either the IoT or the IOE. It's what do you think of today is probably different than somebody how they're gonna think about it tomorrow. But how do you, again, architect that device and what's the unintended consequences of your device? So lack for a better way of saying it is that you may still architect it for your mission critical example, but do you have enough foresight and enough knowledge? And can you think it through, you know, two and three layers deep that says, yeah, but how else could it be used if someone would to take control of this or try to uh, misappropriate what it was meant for in the first place? You know, it's interesting that you should bring that up because I was with my know-how co-host at DEF CON and there was an entire room there that was dedicated to SCADA devices, the supervisory control and data acquisition devices. And those famously, or maybe infamously, have been the focus of a lot of IoT ire because you have these boxes that were created 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago that someone decided to hook up a serial to Ethernet interface and suddenly they're on the Internet they were never designed for that. Right. Um, and what what would be your take on that? I mean, we, we've we got this this internet. That's actually, I like your turn better. We've got this internet of everything where more and more devices are coming online every day. Some of them really shouldn't be online, uh, at least until they get updated. D does does Atmel have a stand on, on that? Do you, do you say these devices should be air-gapped completely or the next generation of SCADA devices will be better because we'll have security built in? So let, let's talk about the SCADA devices first, and then I'll talk to the second part about, about our position and where, where we stand on that. So first off, um, on the SCADA devices, uh, in your entry segment, you talked about where one of the uh, one of the authors or one of your guests had talked about the only way to do it is to throw it away and, and start again, right? I actually think there's there's a lot of validity to that statement, because if it doesn't have security built into the device today, you either need to replace what that, that SCADA device with something that is secure, or you need to be able to provide an interface device that creates that security uh, barrier, if you will, from the internet to the device itself. I mean, because we're talking mission critical things from municipalities, grids, uh, water sources, et cetera. I mean, those uh, industrial, anywhere industrial controls are used, they're, you're right, 20 or 30 years ago, th those are, uh, they're at risk and they're the first place the hackers are gonna look. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's move on to something that I'm sure our audience wants to hear about. Atmel has been around for, what, 31 years, Thir more than 30 years. You've been around for right. three decades. Uh, it's you, You've always been in the semiconductor business, but really your name has boomed. It's, it's gone from a player in the field to, if people say Internet of Things or if people say Maker, they're going to think Atmel. They're going to think of your Atmega chipsets and processors. Uh, and you are in everything from quadcopters to the latest printer that someone might create. How have you seen this maker generation, the tinkerer generation, take your chipsets and do things that you never expected to be done with them? Yeah, so there, there's lots of examples that are out there today. I mean, if you go to any of the maker fairs or if you go to, um, you may or may not, I think you already know, but some of the uh, listeners may not, but uh, Arduino is based on uh, Atmel chips. And then, and so what we're seeing is, you know, from, like you said, just from the tinkerers to all the way up to medical implementations to the automobile. What's what's interesting about Atmel and what makes us so prevalent in the mindset now when you think of, or when you hear IoT and a lot of people spring Atmel into it is because at the end of the day, any IoT device is 
at its core is a is a microcontroller. Uh, it it's it, which and, and because many of them are, are on edge nodes or are self-powered, you wanted to uh, you wanted to have very low power microcontrollers. There is a there's sensing technology, and then there's there's security. So we actually play in two of the three major areas. So we have very low power microcontrollers, which is why we are used in Arduino and why we're used in a lot of these applications. We have embedded security and. The security products that we have, they're actually over 15 years old. So we're not new to the security area. We've been in this area for a long, long time. What we're seeing happening now is, is we actually had a vision about 10 years ago. I joined the company eight years ago, so it was just before my time. But we steadfastly stood behind our strategy and said that we need to make these parts small, low power, and inexpensive because we wanted them to be used in a ubiquitous fashion. We didn't want that tax to be a high tax, right? We didn't want the insurance policy to be so expensive that people didn't use it. And now with, um, like I said, all the, the confluence of all these uh, hacks that are going on is people are now adopting the devices because they recognize, yeah, for a small, you, you got, you're going to have to pay something to implement security. It doesn't come for free, at least real security doesn't come for free. But we've made it so that the barrier to entry and, uh, and the difficulty of doing so is easy. And if you don't mind, if I could take another minute or so, I feel like I'm being long-winded. But, you know, Gartner Research uh, sent something out uh, within the past year, and they said that by 2018, they said 50% of the internet-enabled devices that are out there will be developed by companies that are less than three years old. And in 2018, I've also seen a number of about 30 billion units. So this is a very nascent, very fast growing area. You keep hearing me use the word, the innovators that are out there. So they, they're, they're smart people. They're garage shop guys. They're the tinkerers. They're the makers that you just talked about. But, and, and they know hardware really good. They know software really well. They've got some really bright ideas. But when you start talking about cryptology and encryption techniques, et cetera, people start to get a little intimidated because it's, you, you really have to be an expert in that or comfortable in it. What we've done is made it where it's really just a hardware implementation. So if you go into our Studio 6 or anything else, it really looks like you're just adding a piece of encryption on top, excuse me, a, a, another um, semiconductor that sits next to the microcontroller. So we've taken the provisioning key out of it. We've take, we've built all the encryption into it. We've put it so it's really just via GUI. You can set it up and now you have uh, encryption on your device to make it very easy for them to design it in. I, see, I think that that is absolutely vital. I love the fact that you're enabling this this paradigm of this is the device, and then this extra piece of hardware is your security, and you bolt that on top, and and at least it gives you a modicum of security for that internet of everything. Uh, I, I want I want to come back to this whole idea of the maker generation because it, it's very easy to look at what some people have been doing with with Atmel chipsets, with, with the Atmega processors, and say, okay, well, that's that's fun. It's the, it's the tinker generation. It's the hacker generation. But as you said, the, what we're gonna, the major advances that we're going to see are coming from companies that are fresh, are coming from companies that are new, and are coming from the people who are going to be growing up with, with Atmel chipsets. They're the ones who created the sensors, the really low-cost sensors, that are going to be, be creating the next great big data database that people are going to be drawing from. They're the ones who are going to be creating the, the devices that end up revolutionizing how we collect information. So my question to you is this. If you are offering a solution in which you can bolt on security as an extra piece of silicone, does that then mean that we can free the makers back up to, to go back to think thinking of function first? Because uh, one of the, the presentations I saw was this idea of we need to tell our makers that they now need to consider security. As Chumley in the chat room is saying, it's fine if you can make something, but the question is, should you make this? If, if, if you can't secure it, should you yeah. be creating it? Is yeah. that male thinking, uh, best practice now is, go back to thinking about function first and we'll take care of the security? Yeah, so um, yes and no. I mean, I think it's, it's so first off, um, you're right. So that means that these customers are going to come from what, you know, in the semiconductor industry, we refer to it as that long tail. You know, we have over almost 40,000 customers at any given moment purchasing products from us. Atmel as a company doesn't touch 95% of them because they go through the distribution channels. They'll buy from DigiKey. They'll buy uh, from Farnell. They'll go through any one of the other global distributors that are out there. So we may never actually touch, see, understand, or know that 
customer. So what we need to be able to do is, and which we do do, is in our Studio 6 products and anything else, where we are actually making sure that, and making it very much in their awareness that there is a security chip there, that they should really, if they're thinking about putting anything that's going to be on an internet, we believe that as unvital as you think the information might be, it still is vital and that you should put almost as a mandatory function a security chip on. Now, we can't dictate that to them. All we can try to do is educate them, provide them the, the information, the materials to make them make good decisions, but ultimately they're going to make up, you know, there is free will. So they're going to do what they want. We just try to educate them to ensure that they understand the risks of not putting in security and then also explain to them that we've actually made it very easy for them to go do so. All right, let, let's talk a little bit about that, that free will, what they're going to do with it. What would you say, if you were able to speak to an up-and-coming generation of makers, of tinkers, the people who are going to be using your chipsets, what would be the best practices of security? So they, they're, they're figuring out what they want the device to do. They're figuring out what resources they need to make that device do that. What security considerations would you want them to keep in the back of their mind? Well, depending on which way... We can go really high level on the application side or really low into certain in the, the semiconductor hardware applications. But I think there's several overarching themes that you'd want to uh, I want them to leave with. One is that if you're going to be on the Internet, then you want to make sure that you that you at least put in there mutual authentication. And that's what all that's really doing. And what's that saying is I, you want to make sure that whatever your device is going to go talk to that it's what it's supposed to go talk to, right? So that it's it's a it's a domain or it's an area that that is um, that's a valid one. And the converse is also true, right? So you want to make sure that what you're what what's reaching out to talk to you that you can authenticate that. So you want to make sure you do that because I'll step back because a lot of a lot of the um, the novices they confuse encryption and authentication. Encryption all that does is scramble things, but it doesn't prevent you from actually talking to the wrong thing. So what you want to make sure is that what you're talking to or what you're going to do flash downloads from is what you really intended to talk to and where you really it's a trusted source so you can there's a root of trust the certification process that says yeah these are who they say they are because i can't see them on the internet but i can only reach out through addresses so they they are who they are we've done the handshake we've exchanged our our public keys we know that you're good we know that you're valid and we can use you so i think that's the first thing um then, then bring in provisioning. You know, this is where the keys and credentials are inserted. So again, you want to make sure that that process is clean. That's the part that I was referring to earlier, where I say that we make it easy because we do that for them. They don't have to really think about it. And that's part of what we're trying to do to make sure that security is adopted. That says, in all these things, again, it starts sounding difficult or sometimes complex or maybe intimidating when you start talking about what kind of algorithms you're looking for, what kind of, uh, you know, do you want a SHA, ECC, AES, whatever alphabet acronym that you're looking for. Don't worry. We've already done that for you. And so we can do the provisioning and we've got it where the keys are already embedded into it. We can manage that for you. So it, it's all about making sure that your product is talking to who it's supposed to talk to and that if your product also because these are two-way streets if you're bringing anything back into your domain or into your edge node or into your gateway that it's also been authenticated so there's got to be mutual authentication you need to make sure that there's there is trust involved and that what you're getting is what you're supposed to be getting and what you're giving is who you're supposed to be giving it to i i think that the mutual authentication is that's absolutely primary which is if you can keep your device from from talking to anything it's not supposed to talk to, a lot of the other pieces of security fall into place. But our audience, they're going to demand that I ask this, and that is, do you feel that baking security into a piece of silicone that is going to be forever that piece of silicone is necessarily the best approach? I mean, why, why go with a hardware-based security rather than, say, farming it out to the open source community to, to secure the IoT? Well, so so let's talk about that a little bit because uh, on the hardware side, what we really are putting in hardware are the keys. So, and that's what you never want to be out in the open source, right? You never want to have your private keys open to anyone. So really when we talk about hardware security, yeah, again, we do all the encryption algorithms because then you have to have your public keys that are able to go out and start talking to the other devices. But it's our view that the keys themselves should always be in hardware and they should always be in the device. Then you can use the open source community still to take advantage of the public keys that are out there. Uh, and I don't I actually don't have a problem with that. I don't think Atmel's position on that is 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 fine. 
All right. Uh, actually, that's that's very good to clear up. Uh, I, I know we have to let you go really quickly here. Uh, unfortunately, you do have a hard out. I'd love to have you back at some point so that you can talk a little bit more IoT, perhaps with uh, some of the other experts we've had on the show. But if you were going to leave folks in our audience with some sort of wisdom about designing IoT or IOE devices for their applications, whatever it's going to be, whether they're running a Soho, an enterprise, what would you like to remember about what Atmel can do for that project? All right, thank you. So, like I said, so we actually have the we have the we have the products from the microcontrollers. We have the security. I mean, we actually have and via the Arduino systems, uh, turnkey uh, um, building blocks for you to go build your systems. The one thing I want them to leave with, though, is if you're actually so, so go look at it. Go to atmel.com. You can find our products. I don't want to give ourselves plugs. I want to keep this up a level, but. If you want to develop a low power system that's secure and easy to go do so, come look at us. And if you're thinking about, and this is the biggest point I want them to leave with, if you're thinking about whether you should add security or not, the answer is yes, you do. You may not realize it yet, but, the, but most of them haven't realized it. And when they do realize it, it's too late and they, re and they find out the hard way. You really need, if you're going to be connecting to the internet, you should be implementing security. The answer is yes. I like that. That's fantastic. Uh, now, of course, let's give you the plug time. Please tell people where they can find you, where they can find Atmel, where they should go. Of course, they should go to Maker. They should go to our show here, Know How, because we're using Atmel chipsets all the time. But uh, is there someplace you would like people in the Twiat Riot to go to find out perhaps what project ideas they might get? Yeah, so I, I encourage them to come visit our website. Go to uh, www.atmel.com. We're based here in Silicon Valley in San Jose. Uh, go look at visit through the products. We have multiple design guides out there. We have multiple reference designs that you can look at. Look at our uh, the AVR and 32-bit microcontrollers, depending upon what you're building. And then look at our, um, our security solutions. Uh, our Studio 6 is a phenomenal product. It helps you, uh, and there's the crypto authentication. I love it. So come see us. Go visit us at atmel.com. Rob Valaton, the VP and GM of Atmel. Look for uh, his company's gear in a future episode of our DIY Maker Show Know How. We thank you for being part of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Thanks for having me. Now, folks, when we come back, we've got a treat for you. We're going to be heading over to Black Hat DEF CON. That's right, Brian Burnett and I were there, and we uh, managed to get some video of a few presentations we think you're going to enjoy. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And, well, it's Harry's. Now, let me ask you something. D do, do you like shaving? I, I don't care if you're a man or a woman. You, you probably don't. I mean, shaving is a chore, right? Shaving is something you have to do. Shaving is something that comes up every once in a while, depending on what your genetic background might be. You might have to shave every couple of hours, maybe every couple of days. Maybe like me, you shave every couple of weeks, but at some point you're going to have to shave. Sometimes we get caught up in the tech and the services and the sheer scale of the enterprise, and we forget that there are real men and women, us, who stand behind those servers and switches. And you know what? We deserve to have something nice too. If you've ever had to shave, you know the experience of finding a $20 five-pack of razors on some lonely supermarket shelf sealed behind an anti-theft cargo cage like the precious diamonds, forcing you to wait 20 minutes for an overworked employee to open the security window so that you can have the privilege of buying an overpriced set of refills. I am not bitter at all. Well, why do that if you don't have to? Because Harry's is disrupting the shaver racket by offering us a smooth, high-quality shave at about half the price of the big brand blades. Oh, Harry's was founded by two guys, Andy and Jeff, who had a simple vision for better shaving. They wanted to make their own razors, and they wanted to ship them for free to your front door, and they wanted to guarantee your satisfaction, and they've done it. Now, in each Harry's kit, you're going to get a razor, three blades, and foaming shave gel. The Truman kit is their starter, and at just $15, there's no reason not to give it a try. They also have an aftershave moisturizer that protects and hydrates. The bottom line is that you're going to get a shave delivered to you for a fair price. Do you really need another reason? Just go to harrys.com. Harrys.com and get $5 off your first purchase with the code ENTERPRISE. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S.com and use the promo code ENTERPRISE at checkout. Once again, we thank harrys.com, promo code ENTERPRISE, for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, gentlemen, uh, Curtis, Lou... 
I'm thinking now might be a good time to to head over to DEF CON. Did, did either of you get a chance to check out the Michael Auger and Runa Sandvik presentation? No, unfortunately not. Yeah. I I was here in the swamp, so uh, I'm looking forward to this. Well, uh, without further ado, and actually this was the perfect episode to do it because this is sort of the Internet of Things that should never be connected to the Internet, here's hacking a Linux-powered rifle. Yeah, so the uh, the gun we were hacking is the Tracking Point TP750. Uh, the base rifle is a Remington 700, 308 bolt action. Uh, the scope that sits on top of it, the Tracking Point actually built, is their Cascade platform. They do have a smaller platform called Ares that they put on some of their shorter range rifles. Uh, fairly certain most of the stuff we found here will apply to Ares, but we haven't actually touched one. Uh, runs Angstrom Linux. It's basically a BeagleBone Black as far as the hardware goes. Uh, so just ARM processor. Uh, 255 mega RAM. There's a 16 meg flash chip for kernels, 4 gig for file system and storage. Um, the actual scope has a couple physical buttons to zoom in, change wind, change the mode, uh, as well as some USB ports, power button, uh, temperature sensor, humidity sensor, that kind of stuff. Uh, the way the system works, there's an advanced mode where you can tag your target. So you're looking through the scope, there's a little dot. You line that up on your target where you want to fire, and you press a little red button in front of the trigger. And this tags the target. The gun then calculates the ballistics to actually hit that and moves the crosshairs accordingly. So then when you pull the trigger, the gun doesn't fire until you're actually lining the crosshairs back up onto the dot that you tagged on the target, and then it fires. So it's calculating all the ballistics for you, so your first shot accuracy goes through the roof, even for somebody that's not trained in how to shoot. So just a, um, three things to actually keep in mind about this research. Um, the attacks that we have do require the wireless network on the rifle to be on, and you have to be within range of the Wi-Fi. Uh, we cannot fire remotely. We can do a lot of other things, like lock the trigger to prevent the shooter from actually firing, but we cannot fire remotely. Tracking point set out to do with, with the scope is that it has a wireless network that you can connect to with your mobile phone, and they have two mobile apps for use with the rifle. Um, one is called Shot View, which just allows you to see exactly what the shooter is seeing inside the scope. Um, the other one is called Tracking Point, um, and that's the app that allows you to change things like wind, temperature, you can set a passcode for the advanced mode. In the process of poking at it, kind of through the, the apps and all of that, uh, we kind of a black box test at that point. We didn't really know what we were poking at. We weren't really getting what we wanted, uh, so we decided to tear it open. The device we actually used to dump the file system uh, is just an EMMC to USB adapter. So that's uh, what we ended up using to actually dump the file system. It's a little device that you can hook up the pins that associate with the actual EMMC chip, and then plug it into a computer, dump the file system that way. Um, so we found that the, um, the API, when the, when the mobile apps are communicating with the scope itself, it's completely un unauthenticated. So it means that anyone who can connect to the wireless network of your rifle can use the same app to just change values while you're lining up to take a shot. We found a way to um, hack into the system and just communicate directly with the back end in such a way that we can feed it any value we want. We can say that the bullet weighs much more than it really does um, without the system complaining about this. And we also found that there's an issue with how they do software updates that allows us to create our own soft software update that will work on any tracking point firearm that allows us to get root access on the device. In this demo, what we're going to do is show on the, the left side here, it's going to be what actually happens when you're normal operation. So we'll, we'll tag a target, the crosshairs will drop down, then it'll pause. It'll go to the right side and show what happens. Same behavior, but with the adjusted values to make the crosshairs jump even further. So it tags the target, you see the crosshairs jump, now you're going to line up for the shot. See the second one there. The one on the left hit center target where we were aiming. The one on the right, you can see it hit the uh, target on the left, which is about two and a half feet away from where you were actually aiming. So that's one of the things we're able to do uh, by adjusting the values on the back end. Um, it's, not, it's not all that bad. Tracking Point did actually take um, security into consideration when they built this product. Um, for example, the USB ports on the rifle are disabled during boot, so they don't actually function um, to get onto the wireless network, there is a key. It's guessable and all of that, but you need to know the key to actually connect. Um, the API, when you're using the mobile apps, it does validate user input. So from the mobile app, you can't say that the bullet weighs 
a lot more than it is or that it's a super windy day, for example. So the mobile app does restrict how, how much you can do or what you can do um, with the rifle. Um, and the software updates are protected with GPG. They are encrypted and signed. It's just they have um, a bug in how they implemented that solution. That means that we can get around it. The distance can vary, right? So if I'm using my phone or a laptop with a small antenna, you know, however long that's going to, I think the stated range is around 35 or 100 feet, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, if you have a bigger antenna, there was the Wi-Fi shootout not long ago where they were able to get 50 miles to an unamplified device. So, you know, theoretically, you could totally do that with this as well. Um, as far as seeing what the shooter sees, they've got that shot view app. So if you have a good enough connection to actually stream that video to, you can absolutely see what they're saying. But again, it also still requires you being able to get on the wireless in the first place and the wireless being turned on. So there's, um, once we got onto the system, so we had to open it up and then connect it to our computer to actually get to the file system. And once we were on there, we saw that you have this API that is what the mobile app is using when it's communicating with the scope. Um, but in addition to, to that, there's an admin API that if you know about it, you can use it. Um, and so by finding, finding just the right calls, uh, we, we could actually communicate with the rifle. Given that this device is kind of the first of its kind, really, um, you could very much tell in the hardware where they were kind of going all in because there was no lessons learned from somebody else. They were learning the lessons from the start. Uh, so everything's very well silk screened. So you pull it open and say, oh, TXRX. And uh, I bet that's UART plugging in there it was. But that said, it, it was all password protected. So that still wasn't good enough. We still had to tear it apart to get actually into it. We had to actually connect to the chip that has the file system and then to our computer to actually get to the file system. And once we were on the file system, we could then figure out uh, some more of the vulnerabilities and put together some tools so that we could actually automate our attacks. So, so, so gentlemen, this is interesting. I, I like the fact that we had this video on this episode because uh, as, as Rob was saying, a lot of these makers, these stinkers, are going into it at the first, uh, at the first go. They're, they're finding out functionality that has never existed before. So security is often at the last thing in their mind. It's not part of the thinking process. And, and that's actually what Augur and Sandvik figured out with this tracking point, which is this is the first time anyone's ever made something like this for a civilian population. And they had some security in there. But it definitely wasn't baked in from the start. It was sort of like, oh, we should probably do something about that Wi-Fi because leaving it out in the open is is a bad idea. Uh, I'm I'm guessing, and I, I want your input on this. I'm guessing we're probably going to see a lot of this over the next few years as as new genres of devices come out, easily constructed devices. Security is just going to be slapdash. I'm not sure that I would call it slapdash, Padre. What I would call it is uninformed because I think what we're going to have is a lot of people out there who are designing these systems and they will be designing the security to meet the requirements of people who know what they know. And that means that in this case, you had gun designers looking at network security. Well, I'm, I'm guessing that the intersection of the set of ace gun designers and serious hackers is fairly small. And probably no one in that group was working on the weapon. So they, they secured it from their standpoint and probably made it so secure that they could not imagine how it could be broken into. And I think that's the real problem that we're going to see. Not that people aren't trying to make things secure, it's just that the level of expertise that they can bring to bear at the various device levels isn't nearly up to the standards it's going to need to be in order to protect the devices against the serious hacking community. Lou, actually, Curtis, I love that. Lou, I, I want to bring you in on this. Curtis brings up a great point, which is it's not laziness. It's just if, if I'm designing a gun, if, I'm a, if I am an armorer, I have no idea what network security is or what it means. And I'm thinking in my mind, well, if I can't break this, it must be, it must be okay. If I, if I don't know how to, how to crack WPA2 encryption, it must be okay. If, if they tell me that the file system has a password, I'm thinking it's safe. And it's easy to say, look, I'm not the security expert, so I'm going to leave it to the security experts. But then you get that sort of slapped on at the end feel. Are we coming to a point 
it, which we're going to say, if you are a coder, if you are an inventor, if you are a maker, a DIYer, you have to know security. I don't necessarily think that you have to. I think it's just irresponsible not to say, oh, well, I don't know it. And then as part of the development and life cycle of your product development, you say, oh, I need to hire a consultant to come in and there's any, if there's any and do some fuzz testing and some other things to make sure that there's no security vulnerabilities on this system. And you saw this with like when, a while ago, I don't know if you guys remember, with the 2.4 gigahertz cameras that came to the home care where people used to start. You could put them in their house all over the place and, or, you know, open Wi-Fi cameras that, you know, people without any security on them and to a bunch of people and then um you know and then we'll see what happens and and then you know they they knew that there was going to be no security on it but did they foresee people were going to look into other people's houses they probably did but did they care probably not so i think those are the types of things you're going to see with a lot of these internet devices is they're going to say security is a second afterthought but you know when you're talking and a scope you think that they would start with security but it's just a thought yeah yeah. Uh, your your audio is dropping out a bit, Lou. We'll, we'll try to clean you up in a bit. Uh, now, when we come back, I want to jump into the Enterprise Bytes. I know we normally do them after the blips, but uh, we're flipping around today's episode just because we can. Let's go ahead and take a pause to thank the third sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's Igloo. Now, do you remember when your corporate intranet was the cutting edge of communications? Maybe it had a, a forum, a bulletin board. Maybe it was your own private internet, a combination of the things that you liked the most. Of course, that was then. Today, the reality is, well, most corporate internets are less than new, unique, or special. Anyone that has worked in a corporate environment knows how painful those internets can actually be. The content is stale, the interface is ugly, and you can't access it on your mobile devices. So what good is it? That's why we are so happy to have Igloo as a supporter of the Twilight Riot. Igloo is, well, it's an internet that you'll actually like, actually use. It's a cloud portal that enables you to share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage projects all from the same attractive and intuitive interface. Igloo leverages the best part of an internet, important enterprise-specific data at your fingertips, and what people have come to expect from social. Igloo gives you user comments, like buttons, and the ability to add content based on permission with drag and drop widgets and a WYSIWYG editor. Of course, a beautiful and intuitive interface isn't very useful if your users can't access it on the devices that they're using. That's why Igloo is built with responsive design that automatically reformats to your phone or tablet. Igloo is also customizable. Whether you're a large enterprise using SharePoint or a fast-growing business with a hodgepodge of tools and platforms, you can now create an internet that matches your brand's look and feel, simplifies how you work, and is accessible on any device. Now, how about security? Well, Igloo is secured with SSL and 256-bit encryption. It's baked into a variety of their access authentication and identity services to ensure that only authorized users have access. Now, how about affordability? Well, Igloo offers plans starting as low as $3 per month per user. And unlike other solutions, you get full access to Igloo's entire suite of tools. No upsell, all for one low price. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to sign up and try it for free today at igloosoftware.com slash twit. That's igloosoftware.com slash twit. And when you sign up through our link, you can get your own Igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free for as long as you want. That's right, igloosoftware.com slash twit. igloosoftware.com slash twit. And we thank them for the support of this week in enterprise tech. Gentlemen, let's get back into it. These are some of the stories that we wanted to talk about before we, we broke for Black Hat DEF CON, but they kind of slipped away from us. The first one, it made a splash about two weeks ago, Obama's supercomputer initiative. Uh, Curtis, can you run us through this? Because I know you've been covering this a little bit for uh, Information Week Radio. Well, I have. And, you know, I think it's it's very interesting because we've really seen we've seen a lull in a lot of federal supercomputing activity. We've, we've seen plenty of, of supercomputing activity at the university level. But in general, those are and, and I use this term advisedly, somewhat more modest supercomputers uh, that and you have companies like uh, Cray a traditional supercomputer power that told me a few years ago that they have not had a new customer in over 25 years. So 
it's time for us to uh, to really get the bragging rights back. And it's not just for national pride. It's because the supercomputers are useful. There are things that we're asking computing systems to do that, frankly, you just have to have a great whopping computer to do. Now, the question is, is this going to make supercomputing more affordable? Um, we tend to think of the market working in terms of if you have a bigger market, more people buying something, the cost will go down. That's not always true. And I think that one of the questions to be asked is whether the very few vendors who can successfully build a government scale supercomputer could use those government contractors to really prop up their prices. That's a huge question and, and one that makes a lot of sense. One of the other questions, and, and I think that this is one that a lot of people are asking, is why do we care? Is the number of supercomputers in the U.S. going down because fewer problems require a supercomputer to solve them? And the answer there is, I think, no. We have all kinds of issues from epidemiology to the classic fluid dynamics around uh, transportation systems to, to energy uh, availability and, and energy use that need supercomputers. Um, Padre, I know that you also, uh, you have a background in engineering. And so from your perspective, do you see the number of problems that require supercomputer level power to solve going down? Uh, no, actually not really, uh, especially with the rise of big data. There, there are now big data sets that require more than just a lot of parallel network computers. You do need something that can handle large number sets. But th there is, there's something else of the story that I really enjoy, and that is the fact that in the past, whenever we've built us a, a supercomputer, it's been for bragging rights, masquerading as some sort of national security priority. For example, when the DOJ built what was the fastest supercomputer in the world before China took the lead with their TN2 was it was supposed to model nuclear explosions so that they could guarantee the safety of the United States nuclear stockpile. Uh, before that, they had to build a supercomputer. Before, uh, I think it, they were modeling water flow so that they could determine erosion patterns on some of the major bridges that we have in the United States. So it's always been a purpose-built supercomputer. What I like about the Obama initiative here is he's saying, look, we don't want to have to build a new supercomputer on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't want to shell out money to individual agencies so that they could build the computer that works for them. I think it's time to recognize that our demand for supercomputing is going to increase. It's always going to be growing, so we should always be investing in the project. We should always be looking at ways to leverage what we already have and build something new so that when we find a project that needs the supercomputing horsepower, we're not two years off from actually being able to do it. Uh, Lou, I know that Microsoft could be considered a supercomputing vendor. You've got Azure, right? I mean, doesn't that count? Absolutely. I was just I was just going to say that I, I, in this story that, you know, like they've noticed that most companies nowadays, you know, big corporations are moving more towards the distributed computing sector for a reason. One, because it's cheaper and you can scale. And when you're computing to scale, you can always upgrade that scale. So I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand the story or the initiative. Or why spend the money on this? Taxpayers' money. I just don't get it. I, it's kind of like going to the moon. Who's going to get there first? Well, why? Right? I think it's, again, bragging rights. And I think it's just a waste of money. Okay. Well, actually, I like this. So you've, you've got a differing opinion. Do, do we need to actually build dedicated supercomputers? Don't we already have supercomputing vendors in Amazon, Google, and, and Microsoft? Uh, I, I see Curtis is bubbling in his seat. Curtis, uh, take it away. Well, I'm going to say that we do because there really is a, a substantial difference in the kind of computing devices that are used in commercial computing, even com commercial computing at scale through services like Azure and AWS, and the kind of devices that are being used in supercomputing. I got a chance a couple of years ago to take a tour of the new supercomputer that was uh, just then coming online at the University of Texas.
And one of the things that's true about most com supercomputers being built today is that they are massively parallel devices. They tend to, to be powered not by CPUs, but by GPUs. Uh, the GPUs are doing the calculation. Now, one of the things that I do find interesting is that in general, they're based on open source software, and that goes all the way down into the scheduler. And with a massively parallel system, the scheduler is really one of the two key pieces of kit that you, that you must get right, because figuring out how a job is going to be efficiently and effectively divided up amongst the thousands of GPUs is the key to making this a successful device. It's interesting because the move among supercomputing, at least at the university level, has been toward a more open commodity level system. Um, you are seeing, for example, a move towards C++ and even Java being used as the programming languages of choice as opposed to something like uh, Cray vectorizing Fortran which was a, a great language if you happened to be using a, a Cray, which was a one of these purpose-built vector processing systems that we've been talking about. The, the real limiting factor is that the talent pool for people who can design and code things like the schedulers is pretty small because this is um, like playing four-dimensional chess, not just 3D chess, but 4D chess figuring out how to effectively split this stuff up. The good news is that once we do this on an open source basis, then we really can move these GPU ma massively parallel systems into the commodity space. And at that point, not only will they be less expensive for government institutions, but less expensive for university research and even um, private enterprise research projects. Let me, let me throw that over to you because that's that's an interesting spin on it. Uh, NVIDIA made a huge splash when they released their GPU clusters. You could rent space on a GPU cluster, get, get access to a few thousand of GPUs at a time. And that's that's sort of become, for at least for us, for the lay people, for the people who are dealing with the enterprise that maybe isn't tight, quite government service trying to figure out fluid dynamics, that is a supercomputer for us. And it's it's very attractive because we can go anywhere from a single node up to thousands, tens, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of nodes, and it scales up quite well. So, does that just lend credence to what you've been saying, which is we don't we don't need a dedicated supercomputer program because we've basically created our infrastructure is a supercomputer. You just rent as much of it as you need at any given time. Yeah, I think. I agree with Curtis in many senses, but I think that it's a typical government slash research thing to do is to throw a whole bunch of money at something and then and then try to do a whole bunch of research on one specific thing. But, you know, enterprises and businesses, they want to throw money and be, be able to scale out. Right. And I think that that's that's one thing that's super important here is is you, you know, you know, there are cloud computing. I mean, Azure at some point, I'm sure AWS, all these other places will start to support, you know, distributed computing using GP calcula GPU to calculation, you know, it, like for instance, the Xbox today, granted it's a gaming platform. It's not, it's not for, you know, uh, super computing and, and, and modeling, but you got to remember that, you know, they can offer computing, remote computing in the cloud, uh, gaming of your rendering. So, I mean, I, those are all GPU calculations. So, I mean, at some point, it, you know, distributed computing and the parallel computing is going to get there. Or like you said, you just go to your node and say, scale out when I need more CPU power here. And, and, you know, in, like Google's proved when they create their search engine, you know, distributed computing is, you know, you can do it cheaply, you can create, you know, you can scale out to devices, you know, all these different programs like SETI and, you know, it's all proven that distributed computing is a lot easier to do than building this infrastructure that could cost you millions and millions of dollars and then not be able to upgrade it and move it and scale it. So I think I, I still don't get it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you know what I, it's nice to have a dissenting voice. Thank you so very much. Well, gentlemen, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour. That's right. You have listened. You spent another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten supercomputing clusters. I want to thank all my panelists, of course, to Rob Balaton from uh, from Atmel from being on, but to Curtis Franklin and to uh, Lou Maresca. I, I wouldn't want to do the show without. 
good friends like you by my side. Curtis, if we could start with you. Could you please tell the folks where they could find you and maybe what they could expect on Information Radio this week? Well, Padre, I'll be back at work this coming week. I'll be writing. I'm going to continue with my series of profiles of the companies and people that were recognized uh, as being part of the Information Week Elite 100 this year. Uh, we've got some stuff coming up. Uh, we've got a great show for the IT Life series coming up on Wednesday this week uh, with the host, uh, Dave Wagner. On Friday, we'll have Information Week this week, or Information Week Live coming to you. It's a great discussion, just uh, people looking at the stories of the past week. Um, and Interop Radio is coming back. Check me out at informationweek.com or look at my Twitter feed. It's uh, right down here. And keep up with all the new shows. We're ramping back up for the fall. The, uh, the long, lazy summer is about over and uh, got some great, great stuff coming up. And always, always pleased to be here with you, Padre. Curtis Franklin, thank you so very much. And of course, thank you to Lou Maresca. Lou, you're my host, my co-host on Coding 101. You are, you are the brains of that show. Let's be honest about that. I'm just here for, you know, the good looks. Uh, but you're also a regular contributor to This Weekend Enterprise Tech and Before You Buy, and uh, you've been on Padre's Corner. I, you're slowly taking over more and more of the Twit TV network. Could you please tell the folks where they can find you when you're not planning total social media technology domination? <laughs> Absolutely. You can always find me on Twitter at uh, LouMM. And of course, uh, check out uh, CRM.Dynamics.com. We're coming out with some cool stuff and uh, we're integrating some new acquisitions that we've uh, done lately and uh, we're coming up with some new features. So check it out soon. Thank you very much. And of course, thanks to you. That's right. The person who stops by each and every single week to watch. We couldn't have a show without you, without your interest and without you telling other people about This Week in Enterprise Tech. So we want to do a little something, something for you. We want to make it easy for you to get This Week at Enterprise Tech into your device of choice each and every single week automatically. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find not just all of our episodes, but also a little drop-down menu that lets you subscribe so you can get the audio version, the video version, the high-definition video version into your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your desktop, your Mac, your PC, anything that you want to use to listen to us or watch us, you'll find it right there. Also, don't forget that you can find me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And you'll find out who we're going to be having on every episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. You'll find out who, what topics we'll be covering. And you'll be able to suggest future topics and guests for the show. It's one of the best ways to reach out. Again, that's twitter.com slash PadreSJ. Finally, thanks to everyone here in the studio who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lisa and to Leo for letting me do the show for three years now. Uh, of course, to the staff here who, who makes the show possible, to Carson, my super producer. And ladies and gentlemen, making his triumphant return, Mr. Brian Burnett, the cranky hippo. He is officially my TD once again. So good to have you back, Brian. Can you tell the folks where they could find you? You're dote some. Hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. Considering our uh, our last know how episode, that's where people can find us. Well, me and you working together. Uh, Thursdays at eleven o'clock. But uh, if you want to understand what Padres Doge reference is about, you should probably check out last week's episode. Uh, my birthday is coming up. Alex got Tomorrow! me. Tomorrow. Alex Gumpel, the engineer here at the studio, got me a pretty cool gift. So you should check that out. You're gonna be old, right? You're like turning twenty, I think. Ha. Ah, uh, the big 3-0, oh, Padre. Wow. The big 3-0. Oh. You know, they say from 30, there, right? 30 is the new 80, so. Yeah, that's what it's feeling like. Yeah, yeah getting old there. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.